there's that thing of right how do we make that model work you know to build the longevity into the product and that is the way that some companies like mud jeans for example in europe they rent the jeans out you know so it's it's that whole like lease the the soft walk on the floor you know um there's companies who've done the cradle to cradle certification uh, on their carpets like deso and tarquette in the us you're not buying the materials you know you're leasing a soft walk on a floor and the rest is Hey guys, it's Mandy with Global Hemp Association. I wanted to say thank you so much for joining. I'm excited about the opportunity to build a relationship and connect this supply chain. I mean, after all, that's why we started the association. Our association was built on the foundation of connecting supply chain, building relationships, and helping you grow your business. Anyone from farmers, manufacturers, and distributors, people that are passionate about the supply chain, and those creating products selling into biofuels, plastics, textiles, construction, and building materials. Hello, welcome everybody. I'm excited to be on today. I'm really excited to be talking about the subject we're going to be diving into, circularity and sustainability and the opportunity that the hemp industry has to really take a hold on these discussions, right? And I'm really curious too, as we dive into this, what we see outside of the United States and opportunity here within the United States. But before we do, I want to remind everybody, drop in, say hello, leave us a comment. Um, we're excited to say hello to everybody. I'll be sure to shout them out or uh, give you a shout out. And then before we do get started, remind everybody that later this afternoon, we're going to be going live again as we have a few guests for our education series. Uh, we have an education series this afternoon with four awesome guests that we're going to be discussing or diving into ESG. So I uh, what is it? Environmental governance and sustainability. And so it's a perfect piggyback right after this conversation. And then um, to follow or like or follow us on our YouTube channel, it's Global Hemp Association and find any additional information for other meetings on our website, globalhempassociation.org. So without further ado, I'm excited to announce our guest, Brendan. Brendan, welcome. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks so and much, Mandy. It's been, uh, it's been a while since we've... Uh... We've spoken about this and finally we're here. Thank you. Whoop, whoop. I'm excited to have you. <laughs> so tell me a little bit or give yourself an intro or give our guests a little intro about, or background about where you came from, how you got into this and yeah, what, are you, what are you up to nowadays? So um, hi, everyone. I'm Brendan Rowan from, um, from Glasgow in Scotland uh, in the UK. Um, I've been working in the cradle to cradle and circular economy re, uh, arena for probably uh, let's call it 12 years now um, quite an exciting adventure um, my business partner well now ex-business partner Paul and myself started the, the cradle to cradle marketplace um, only focusing on cradle to cradle certified uh, products uh, back in 2014 um, and I guess there's a couple of you thinking about what is cradle to cradle and what does that mean? Um, so I'll dive into the meaning of that if, if that's okay. Um, Please, yeah. So some of you guys might know what circular economy is. Um, you, you may have seen some of the butterfly diagrams about you know being able to retain um, materials and so forth in closed loop cycles and utilizing um, reutilizing materials in, in different areas of, of industry. Um, that's one aspect of the, the cradle to cradle um, approach that we look at. Um, we're also looking at the design elements in terms of the materials that you use. So for example, um, the material health, the material reutilization, um, the water stewardship, the renewable energy, and the social fairness element of working in that industry. So you're looking at those five criteria and with the cradle to cradle design uh, framework, what you're doing is you're looking at your product or your, uh, your, your design and your manufacture of your products in that light. So your product will be assessed against those criteria um, to then define what ranking that your product will, will have eventually. So there's a lot more to it, obviously, in terms of, of the, the actual certification process, um, but the defining of those five criteria is really where we start, right? 
Okay, so talk to me a little bit about opportunity that we have within the hemp industry, right? Where do you really see this as a um, opportunity zone or why should the hemp industry really be focusing right now on this opportunity? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think in reality, the, the, the hemp industry is quite new, you know. Um, it's probably a good sort of 10, 15 years old in the U.S. particularly, um, uh, and it's a burgeoning industry. Um, the, the the cradle to cradle methodology is 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 also quite reasonably new. It's not mainstream yet. So, um, you know, in, in light of that, I think there's an opportunity for the hemp industry, um, particularly in, in product manufacture, to adopt the principles and adopt the the processing and the uh, the concepts behind that. Um, and and that really defines, um, I think, a new strategy. Uh, yes, we've all got to make sure that our hemp products are uh, FSC or, or whatever the case may be. So there are criteria by which the hemp products are assessed already. Um, you know, the federal government will obviously uh, have certain criteria that they need to meet. Uh, and potentially there's some ISOs and so forth that come into play as well. But if we're looking at um, products that are designed with hemp uh, in the States, I would, I would suggest that Cradle to Cradle uh, design framework has the potential to um, differentiate hemp uh, in the industry or in manufacturing in, in general in, in the US, but in particular the hemp uh, industry because you know the the because it's new and there's still quite a, a lot of kind of um, hurdles to be uh, overcome. The potential for the cradle to cradle design framework to to really differentiate the methodology will allow the industry to kind of be an exemplar rather than just be, oh, well, it's it's similar to cotton or it's similar to any other textile or, or, or manufacturing process. If we, you know, if the head industry adopts those principles, then I would say there's there's quite a, a, a an opportunity there to differentiate and, and obviously work with other industries uh, in, in harmony with the cradle to cradle design uh, framework. I'm curious about projects that you've um, worked on. Can you give me some examples, maybe not sure. companies, but some examples of, yeah. So um, one of one of the really, my favorite with, uh, products that we've worked with, um, in fact, the, the, the company's moved across to Florida recently, um, is a is a, a little tool called the, the Wonder Wing. Um, it, it is a tool that um, basically helps um, mothers and well, mothers and fathers, for that matter, uh, wean the young babies. So a lot of the time, um, and you know, potentially we're looking at, at uh, impoverished areas in, in, of the globe where there's no electricity or no access to batteries. Um, how do you how do you get the the, the weaning process underway? With solid foods, you know, without having to spend too much money on uh, getting packaged food or, or so forth. And one of the things that Lindsay, the manufacturer um, or the conceiver of this idea, uh, you know, mentioned to me during the process was the fact that there's huge amounts of baby packaging, baby food, and purified food packaging that goes to landfill. You know, these these plastic sachets with that plastic bottle on the top, plastic top on the uh, on the packaging is just, it's its horrendous, right? So she came up with this idea um, and she said she wanted to go with the concept of designing it so that we can reutilize the materials once that that tool is, has been used, right? So a baby weans for maybe 18 months to two years max. And all you do really with this tool is you put it in the bowl um, it has mas maceration teeth on either side, um, and it macerates the food, and you can then feed your baby. But generally, that food is the food that you and I would make as parents. So, you know, have the steak, have the potatoes, have the beans, stick them in the macerator, and give it to, to your baby to, to eat as a, as a, a mashed up um, non-solid, right? Um, but the materials and the way that those materials were handled um were were twofold 
The first in terms of the actual material was um, a bio-based uh, plastic made by Eastman, uh, the chemical company who've adopted the, the cradle to cradle principles in, 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 in entirety. Um, and also the, the way of reclaiming that. So to reclaim that material, because ultimately the whole point of the circular economy is to retain the value of the materials you've made, right? Because you spend a lot of energy and time and effort making that thing. Eventually, as a, as a, as a company, you want to retain the value and get that back from the client, right? Or the customer. So there's a, there's a model that's put in place to then, you can do three things. You can either take that, uh, and then gift it to, to another family. So, uh, it's cleaned. It's hygienic, hygienically cleaned by the company and then gets sent back out as a used product. Um, and that can then come back to the factory, get repelletized and made into another product, right? So, that's where the value retention is. So that's that, that story of, of the circular economy. Um, and for, for us as, as manufacturers and people that work in that industry, um, there's a big human element of, in terms of that because you're mitigating a lot of waste in terms of, of getting that product out into the industry. And I think that's something that the, the hemp industry can, can, and, can and has done. Um, in, in terms of materials use, you know, there's a lot of the plant that gets utilized, right? So that cycle of, right, how do we use the oils? How do we use the fibers? How do we use the chafe or, or the shift or, or whatever the case may be? Um, the, the, the real trick with the innovation in terms of using cradle to cradle methodology is to define how many uses or what uses those things uh, can lend themselves to, which is a great opportunity. I love it. I just had to yell at my dog. He's crawling <laughs> on the table behind me. I don't know if anybody saw that, but why do you have dogs? I don't know why, what my deal is. Well, to do this, to entertain us while we're being entertained, right? I'm sorry. Yeah, what a pain in the rear. So what's, what are some things as people are adopting the cradle-to-cradle -cradle, um, framework that you're really seeing as improvements or the you know, what, what's really opening the eyes of people to once they've maybe, you know, started to explore this or been educated a little bit, where are you finding that, you know, the gap has been able to be bridged? Yeah, that's an important question. I think that the relative elements um, for, for industry in particular are very much in the built environment. Um, the, the, one of the founders of, of the Cradle to Cradle uh, a product innovation program was to um he's an architect right so he he him and his, his uh william mcdonough and 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 uh michael brown got founded the, the the cradle to cradle methodology uh wrote the book remaking the way we make things so you guys can go and have a look and, and find that uh, as a resource if you want um but the, the fact that he's an architect kind of pointed to the fact that there was a lot of materials starting being made in that arena, right? So um, a lot of built environment materials, you'll find a lot, a lot of the percentage of the Gravel Grail certified materials in that environment. Um, but there's also the fashion industry. Um, there's not a huge amount at this point in terms of, of customer facing product, um, but it's coming, you know, uh, the information is there. People are starting to engage. Um, it is becoming one of the, and it is currently um, one of the most authentic and scientifically proven um, methodologies and recognized as the gold standard, if you wish, uh, of product manufacture. So the, the knowledge and the expertise is, is also being shared a little bit more readily. Um, the, the growth in terms of the amount of one and the amount of certifications has grown. Um, so the scope is really quite, uh, it is a burgeoning movement as it were, you know, um, mm -hmm. and we're getting bigger companies adopting the principles in, in their product manufacture. Um, and sometimes, you know, you're getting smaller SMEs that are looking at that as a leverage tool to, to, to really engage the sustainability strategies that they have for their companies. So, you may not necessarily adopt cradle-to-cradle -cradle certification for a product, but you could look at the principles to 
you know, start touching on really achieving, um, you know, top-notch sustainability um, criteria. Well, and I see, especially in the United States, right, this subject of sustainability is becoming more and more carbon neutral, right? The concern about the carbon footprint is becoming more and more relevant. And often at the top of the conversation is how does hemp play into that? So I'm kind of curious, what does hemp look like? And, you know, how does hemp really play a role in, say, the manufacturing, right? The manufacturing of hemp. Um, so yeah, the, 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 I mean, there's a there's a lot of question, as you say, in, in terms of of uh, carbon management and and so forth. Yeah. And you know, one of the criteria in the in the cradle to cradle approach is um, water and soil stewardship, right? So you know, with hemp not needing as much water in terms of its growth, uh, also having a higher yield in percentage uh, in comparison to some other stocks. Um, you know, the soil stewardship element is quite critical as well. So what goes back into the soil is, is healthy stuff generally, unless you're, you know, you're using pesticides that are slightly uh, nefarious in some ways. Um, but, you, yeah, you, you're basically looking at those criteria. Um, and I think, you know, in a lot of sense and a lot of terms of, of what the, the hemp manufacturing and growth of uh, the plant particularly is about, is the fact that already there are some elements that are um, you don't have to, you don't have to do huge amounts of work to get some of that certification underway. If that makes sense, right? So you're really doing some of those tick boxes in terms of right. Well, your water stewardship is going to be reasonably you know reasonably comparable to cotton, for example, uh, and probably better than cotton. So there's there's criteria that you'll meet that you know potentially already. Allows you to 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 rank up if that makes sense, right? Yeah. So, you know, the, the hemp is in a better position to, I would say, and, and you know, I'm generalizing here, but I would say is in a better position to attain accreditation in terms of of product manufacture because of the kind of plant it is and because of the way that it's manufactured. So th there's a propensity here for, I would say. Hemp manufacturers making clothing and, and you know curtains and textiles and so forth. Um, you know, have a look at it because I think there's a, a massive benefit in terms of not only the credentials that you're going to get, but also the market differentiation that that it allows. You know, you know that if your cradle to cradle certified product is at let's say gold level, that is that has gone through the rigor of scientific analysis down to the parts per million for all the dyes, for all the processing, making sure that the water stewardship is up to scratch, that all the water that comes out of that processing plant is fit for human consumption, um, that all your energy comes from uh, off-grid, and if not off-grid, that it's that it's kind of green. Um, you know, your social fairness elements are the people that are, that are working on that, that farm and processing that, that product. Uh, I'll be paid fairly and all that kind of stuff. There's sort of anti-slavery um, elements in there. And that you have a return, reuse, recycle strategy, you know. So you're, you're looking at, you're assessing your product at those five levels. So you know as a as a customer that they're doing the right thing, you know, and, and maybe more so in that case. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So change from consumer there's a lot of talk about the consumer driven market right tell me about their what are you seeing as far as change on the consumer side about the cradle to cradle certification and the circular I think it's, yeah it's um the the it's definitely becoming something that's that's aging its way into the mainstream you know there's a lot of talk about it there's everyone knows about or a lot of people know about the circular economy um, but what they don't know is, is what the, how the circular economy and, and cradle to cradle are so closely interconnected. Um, mm -hmm. And the, so, so there's a kind of a follow on in terms of knowledge about all of this sustainability stuff, right? So if you're passionate about sustainability and you really understand the, the, the metrics and the calculations and the, uh, you know, how to get, how does it look in terms of numbers? Um, that that is kind of starting to become uh, a lot more visible in in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. um, 
the concept of cradle to cradle, a lot of people say, oh, yeah, I know the, I know the idea. It's just really good recycling or whatever the case may be. Um, you're mistaken there. It's actually a lot more intrinsic um, to the sustainability strategy. So it, it goes way beyond um, just being responsibly recycling stuff, you know. Um, so the customer or the consumer is starting to need validation in terms of the level of transparency that you have as a manufacturer or as a retailer. So, you know, that level of transparency is is communicated with when you see that cradle to cradle certified stamp on the product, the clothing or whatever, you know that that thing has gone through that process and is a healthy product and a good product and it has its it has its criteria in place. Um, you know, and, and that's not to say that other products don't. It's just that that is a that is a validation of the work that's been done for that product. Um, that and that's product? another thing in terms of what the clients and customers are demanding. Um, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I wasn't looking at sustainability as a as a thing in my clothing. For example, I just wanted good clothing. But now that you know, the the younger generation are looking at the criteria by which people are living so you know they they are demanding that we say well where's where is my pair of adidas made or where are, where is my nike top made or you know so they and who are they made by so there's this traceability and transparency element that's come into our society you know um in some ways i guess it's a little bit nefarious in, in this whole sort of cancel culture and and so forth but you know the, the there's the upside of that is the fact that well, we need to know the, the truth and the authenticity of what is happening around us in industry, you know? Well, and I think, okay, so I've, I've said this for a long time and I'm a little bit embarrassed to admit this, but I was so disconnected from how my clothes were made until I got into hemp, until I started to understand what that looked like and why we're paying a dollar for a shirt or $3 for a shirt and it's traveled thousands of miles and touched multiple people's hands, right? think about who's getting paid from that $1 or $5 that we bought that shirt for. Um, and so, yeah, I think it is to me, it's an eye opener and, and the younger generations are more and more aware of the greenwashing and the true recyclability, like how much is actually being recycled and what is what do those processes look like or labeling a bottle hemp plastic that we know is potentially biodegradable, but really only needs to be 25% Exactly, yeah. exactly. You know, a very so small percent. It's two percent hemp. Uh, great. <laughs> yeah. You know? um, and that is yeah. it. People, people are getting called out for for false advertising or or being disingenuous yes. with their marketing. You know, um, I, I was having a discussion with with somebody yesterday about bamboo socks. Um, you know, they had. And I said to them, read the label. I didn't know that it said it on the label, but I said, read the label and check it out. And it said it has. 0.4% bamboo yeah. in these socks. The rest is all polyester and cotton. So, yeah. you know, there's we've got to look behind the veil. And I think that's what's happening, you know, with Cradle to Cradle being a, uh, a design protocol that is, you know, it, it's pretty rigorous. And, you know, yeah. it's, it's I'll say this, it's not an inexpensive route, but there's also the mitigations in terms of that cost. So, you know, if you have a, a dye or something that, that, has cadmium or lead or, or hexavalent chromium in it or some kind of nefarious chemistry in the front end and you pollute the river, your fine from, you know, from a federal government agency will be exorbitant. So what you're doing by spending that maybe, you know, 20% more on getting that certification than, than ordinary other certifications, for example, you're spending a little bit more on that, but you're also mitigating a lot of potential harm down the line, you know. Um, and you know, let's face it. If you're if you're more transparent up front, your customers are going to have that trust level going up as you as you go into the marketplace. You know, so that's really what advertising is all about. It's like, hey, trust me. You know, um, having having worked in the in the commercials industry for a while, that that's the story. You know, trust this toothpaste; it'll make your teeth white. Uh, you know, trust this car; it drives really well. Uh, look how it handles these corners around a lovely South African mountain, you know, or whatever the case may be. 
So it's that trust level that I think the, the cradle to cradle design methodology also lends to the, the customer as well. Yes. Well, and like we said, you know, consumers or the customer are really are really concerned and they're willing to pay and put their money where their mouth is now. Right. They're they're starting to pay for that. Um, and yeah, they don't mind awesome. paying. What? They don't mind paying as long as they know that there's longevity in the product. You know, this fast fashion thing has started to really not be that popular. Um, so, you know, there's there's an article I read yesterday, in fact, about hemp that the, 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 the Levi's company originally started making hemp out of the old um, sales from, from American warships. And they discontinued that because the products lasted too long. So th there's that thing of, right, the, how do we make that model work, you know, to build the longevity into the product? And that is the way that, that some, some companies like Mud Jeans, for example, in Europe, they rent the jeans out, you know. So it's, it's that whole, like, lease, the, lease, the, yeah. lease the, the, the soft walk on the floor, you know. Um, there's companies who've done the cradle-to-cradle -cradle certification uh, on their carpets, like Desso and Tarquette in the U.S., you're not, you're not buying the materials, you know, you're leasing a soft walk on a floor and the rest is up to the company to service. So they retain the value of the soft, of the, of the carpet, of the, the, the sisal or the hessian or the dyes or whatever materials they use those things out of or the reclaimed plastic from the ocean or whatever they're using, they reclaim that value. What you're doing is you're paying for the service of that soft walk on the floor. <laughs> that's the see it's yes it goes back to the trust and the messaging and the market and really i think that the cradle to cradle certification is about the story right that we're 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 being able to show the cradle to cradle story and every hand that touched it in between for the most part so talk to me about yeah. companies first i have to say to marion hello thank you for joining gavin hi i see you're on and amit hello wanted to just drop a note really quick um, please, anybody else that's listening, say hello, drop drop a note. Um, but talk to me then about when is it when is it ideal for a company to be getting involved? You know, when somebody that's in the industry or somebody who, um, you know, is, is building a, a manufacturing facility, especially as we're just building the, somebody said yesterday, Chris Diapolo yesterday or earlier this week said, you know, we're in the labor and delivery room. We're just starting with this industry. <laughs> yeah. So when is it a good time and who should be really thinking about this and considering this? Um, yeah, I just want to point to, to, to Christine's um, comment as well is, is it definitely is that period of time, you know, um, and it is in, in some ways it's, it's really exciting and dynamic, uh, you know, and, and, the my colleagues in the in the cradle to cradle community will agree that you know it's it's pioneering kind of work and it's never going to be easy you know it's it is a difficult thing to sell you know as it were um and i say the word sell in, in a very light-hearted way but um you know we're, the the stories do speak for themselves and the success stories are you know almost daily now there's there's stuff on linkedin on all the different media channels that all of these companies are adopting the principles and creating really great value and bringing social benefit and, and all of that kind of stuff, you know, which is fantastic. Um, but I think to your question about timing, as soon as you understand and get to know about it, um, you know, when I first read the book in 2007, I was like, we've got to change the world now, you know. <laughs> um, and it's taken, you know, it's taken me almost this long to, to really get on uh, – under the skin of what it's all about, um, and and now being able to talk about it reasonably confidently. Um, as soon as you know that that that's where you want to go, start because you're never gonna. There's never going to be a right moment. Um, I mean, ideally for for hemp manufacturers, I would say if you're in the process of of building a, maybe an indoor growing facility or whatever, um, any and, and you're manufacturing. Big yeah, one. any processing or manufacturing facility, I think that absolutely, the, especially in the hemp industry, so many of us are in this industry because of what it can do to our our planet and our people. Right? Then the exactly. manufacturing has to be considered, and the the life cycle of the business or in, of the product. 
Yeah, and I'm just gonna I'm gonna call you on that word life cycle because you know okay. I know it's kind of a tricky thing for for yeah. products in a in a in a in an environment like this. But I always I like to correct, and it's it's just one of those things. Um, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's why you're here. I um, like it. That it's not a life. You know, this thing is not a living thing, right? This yeah. is this yeah. is a use cycle item. It's Yes, the plant is living. I get you, but it's it's actually a use cycle. So, yeah. you know, there's there's all of this the, the discussion about life cycle analysis and all of that, and I get that. I understand where it comes from, but when we're looking at the cradle to cradle approach, it's very much about use cycle. Um, you know, we don't cradle to cradle does not assess food products or food items, so yeah. or anything that's ingested, for example, or you know, there's a criteria list of things that we don't get involved in. Um, and that includes things like weaponry and things that can do harm and, and so forth, right? Um, so if you're making a cradle-to-cradle -cradle certified product out of hemp, it will be uh, a use cycle analysis that we probably look at. Um, okay. But to your question, I think the, 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 the yeah, the fact that, that you are, stop, are you making something out of hemp, whether it be hempcrete or clothing or whatever it is, start the process as soon as you can because I, I really do believe that hemp has the opportunity, particularly in the US, um, to to revolutionize the, the industry. You know, it really, it really does. And why do you say particularly in the US? What's your, you know, what's well, your, I think the market in the UK is quite small. Um, there's, I know there's seven locations here that, that have got – uh, licenses, the licensing problem. There's there's a lot of issues here. You know, um, it's it's still seen as a kind of a, a bad product, um, and that you know the CBD stuff has started to slowly but surely whittle away at the legalities and so forth. Um, you know, it's once we get that whole lentil head rubbish out of our perspective, I think it'll it'll be a great thing. You know. Um, and, and, you know, smoke it, do what you want with it. But ultimately, the, the, the hemp industry is a different thing. You know, it's a different animal. Um, and I think we need to look at it that way. You know, um, it's time to, to get our head out of the sand and, and start making some, some good hemp stuff, really, you know. Um, and the U.S. has, you know, has a history with it. Um, I think the first piece of hemp material that was manufactured uh, correct me if I'm wrong, was um, almost 2,600 BC in the United yeah. States, you know. Um, well, it wasn't the United States then, but, uh, you know, the, the indigenous tribes used that left front center. It was their go-to material for all their clothing, you know, uh, and a lot of their, their household goods were made from hemp material. So it's, 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 a, it's the base material. It's almost like the staple diet of, of the, the U.S. industry. Uh, and then cotton came along and, yeah, changed the direction of, of, of that industry. Uh, and I think it's now time to, yeah, to, to pick up the, um, that starry-shaped leaf and, and change, change the way we go with it in the U.S. particularly, you know. Um, they've just legalized it in South Africa now. There's, there's a lot of really interesting uh, legislation down there. Um, it, I think that, you know, the, the, the U.S. seems to be the leader in this particular field. So. So may it be, and for, for many years to come, hopefully. Yeah, well, and, you know, you said before when I was asking, you know, what opportunity does the hemp industry have? We're at the very beginning, right? We get to create a sustainable circular economy or, you know, cradle-to-cradle -cradle certification on our products from the get-go without going in and having to reinvent what we're doing or, or you know, retool our equipment to be more sustainable starting from the get-go. And like you said, really diving in as soon as you're aware of what you're trying to do or as soon as you have an idea, right? Exactly. I mean, you know, the the, the greatest folly is knowing how to do something and not doing it, you know. Um, yeah. I think I know there's probably a couple of guys on here that are going, well, you know, where do I start? I'm already at this stage or that stage. There, there's always a way, you know. We can innovate in terms if you're already making materials and things, you'll probably find that, you know, if you've got a manufacturing facility that creates materials or ropes or whatever the case may be, you probably find that there's not a huge amount of work to be done in terms of actually getting a certification, you know, because you'd have already had to go through a couple of hoops with different federal government organizations and, and certifications 
you know, potentially ISO 14001 comes into play or ISO 8001 or any of those other ISOs that, that apply particularly to that industry. Um, you know, having done that work already, you'll probably find there are criteria that are also aligned with the multi-attribute approach that is cradle to cradle. So, you know, you probably have a lot of potential for, for getting somewhere, you know. You don't know until you look, right? So right. I think that's that's the reality. And if you are literally starting out, you know, you've got an investment from, from a banking organization or uh, a funder or, or something like that, use the cradle to cradle methodology and the understanding to leverage the business model. Because if you start with the circular economy model, you're probably going to get a little bit further than just diving in and doing the job, you know. Um, it's it, it obviously takes a lot of hard work, a lot of insight, um, and, and a lot of communication between the different departments of, of you know of, of industry, etc. But it's it is possible, and you know I, I always say and I always end a lot of my emails with, remember, together we can. You know, we're a team. We're we're a, we're a group of people that all have a very similar outlook on life, and we want to demystify the whole hemp industry and create it as a proper burgeoning successful environment for people to work in right gavin just had a great comment australia was seen as a hemp colony for uh, of the empire in the late 1700s so that just goes to show yes yeah totally um you know and they were making a lot of the british sales and and british flags in fact um there's i know in, in sydney there there's a um, there's a British flag that is made out of hemp that stands in a big box, you know, that comes off a particular ship. I can't remember the name, but, you know, hemp is, it has a massive history. Um, and, you know, I think it's time to, to rewrite some of that, not historically, but write a new future with it, I think. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I have, we have another good comment, and I want to bring this up when we move into... Sure. You know, what are some of these concerns or how do people get into this? Um, funding is a big concern in our in our hemp industry. So we need to find better opportunities for um, the innovators that can pay, afford to pay for this. Right. Talk to me about some of this hurdle and bringing this together. And are you seeing this as being a concern, the ability to finance or fund these um, sure, certifications? Absolutely. Um, I mean, it's it's uh, as I said before, cradle to cradle. Um, manufacture and, and diving into all of that is not it's not an inexpensive thing. Um, initially, it's it's going to be a little bit more expensive than potentially other ways of of certifying products. Um, but then I always ask the question: What is the what is the cost of not doing it? So, and I know that's kind of a philosophical answer, but um, I, I'm not a fan with the US systems of, of, of uh, funding and, and access to, to government funding, if that happens, or federal funding. Um, in the UK, we've got government grants, which you can apply for. Um, there was a gentleman, I can't remember his name, two weeks ago. He was on in terms of making applications to a particular bank, I think it was. Um, the head bank, was it? Um, and, you know, those kinds of organizations are there to help people make uh, headway you know um and i think where where my expertise and my colleagues in in the you know in the sort of circular economy uh, arena our expertise helps get those over the line by applying really good business modeling um mm -hmm. and also creating um a, like a gantt chart or, or a you know a process of how we're going to get to that point of say, all right, great, we need three million to do this. How is it going to be spent? What's it going to be spent on? You know, we've got to look through the process of how that looks um, in a in a circular way. So you you will find that applying the, the modeling and, and so forth, um, in, in particularly the circular economy perspective, will start saving money. You know. Okay, so how do people get in touch with you? For those that may be interested, how do they reach out to you to, to my email engage? is my email will be probably part of the part of the notes, but it's uh Brendan B R E N D O N R O W E N at iCloud.com. Um 
I recently resigned from uh, from my previous company, working with my yeah. two lovely business partners, um, Chilene and Paul. So they have a company called 540 World, which is a really amazing uh, platform to engage the UK uh, cradle to cradle industry and circular economy activity. Um, and you know, I'll still, I personally will still be doing consultancy and and so forth in terms of. Uh, the circular economy, sustainability, and, and the cradle-to-cradle -cradle methodology. Um, so, yeah, tap me up if you need information. Uh, I'm on the end of the Zoom. Uh, we can, you know, share that information down the line as well. Awesome, awesome. And you're, you've are you been on a couple of our calls. I'd love to have you back on one of our group calls as well, not just streaming live, um, where we can really engage in more conversations. And I want to also, I'm really excited to share, we're getting ready to launch the Hemp Hallway, which is a community platform where we'll be able to communicate, drive conversation, collaboration, find business partners. And then I need to give a shout out to Robert about manufacturing. He said that they're manufacturing um, hemp herd filled bioplastics now and need quality hemp herd. So if anybody's looking, reach out to Robert. And Robert, I can uh, reach out and make some great connections for you as well. I'm excited about this. So talk to me a little bit. I'm going to play devil's advocate then on this circular cradle to cradle certification. Talk to me about some of the cons, right? What are some of the hurdles that you've had, um, I guess, in, in this space? None. <laughs> this is how no, I feel. Well, uh, you know, the, the, the main you, hurdle has always been. <laughs> you know. <laughs> one of the one of the main hurdles has always been cost, um, because yeah. you know once you find out, oh bugger, we've got you know there's some nefarious chemistry in the dye that we've got, um, or mm. there's a behaviour in in the supply chain that isn't um, aligned with some of the criteria. Um, or oops, we've got some effluent that's that's leaching stuff into the rivers, or uh, you know, where all of our electricity comes from the grid, or whatever. There's there's elements that can come up that will, you know, it doesn't mean the actual certification itself is a costly thing. What it means is that if you want to get that certification, you're going to need to change some of your behaviours and some of the things that you currently do. So that could cost something in terms of changing your processing or changing some element of the, the way that, uh, you know, the staff behaves or the staff performs or whatever the case may be. So, you know, there's 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 a knock-on cost of being responsible for things, right? So when you start taking responsibility, that generally means that you're going to, it's going to cost a little bit. So I think that too, that is is kind of an indirect con, if, if you wish. Um but it's a consideration, you know. Everyone wants to to create a business or create a business to to generate uh, goodwill in the world as well as profit. So, you know, if you're eating into your profit with something that you don't necessarily see the value in in five years time, for example, then it's it's problematic, you know. Um, so you've got to be convinced and really passionate about what you want to do with this stuff. You know, it's like I know a lot of the folks in the hemp industry are, are committed to it. Um, and now there's something else to be even more committed to, you know. So if you want to create that level of sustainability, and I think that, that as I said before, I think the standard of, of the hemp industry could, could be an exemplar in this environment. Um, the, the manufacturing standards could come to that point. Um, it would be amazing, you know. Um, and that, that to me is probably the main con. Uh, the... I guess there's some elements in terms of um, because the brand of Cradle to Cradle as such is not as as globally recognized. Um, I mean, it's burgeoned a lot. It's grown a lot in the last five years. Um, the awareness of it um, may may not be as as wide uh, widely accessible to, to everybody. So, um, yeah, we don't know. There's not a huge amount of, of advertising around it. But... I think once people start getting to know that, it, it does it does make a difference. Um, you know, when you pick up a bottle of shampoo or a bottle of something, you look at by and there's a couple of labels there and you recognize the, you know, the, the Soil Association or uh, the Rainforest, Natural Rainforests logo or one of those accredited uh, associated bodies, then you kind of, there's a trust element there, you, like I said before. Um, and Cradle to Cradle has got that level, but not many people know about it, if that makes sense. So 
I suppose that could be seen as a, you know, it's a difficult thing to, to challenge, but um, we're getting there, you know. I think it's that paradigm shift we've been talking about, right? It's this change from fastest, uh, you know, most convenient to what is more stable, more what more sustainable and better, you know? And I think that, again, it's driven from our younger generations. Unfortunately, my generation and my parents are probably not going to see the effects of what we've done as far as this, these poor practices, you know, and another huge benefit within the construction, or I mean, within the hemp industry is, you know, this savings on cost, if cost is the hurdle or these changes, getting in and making the right change prior to, prior to the construction or the development of the facility, instead of sure. trying to go back in and fix, right? I can see that's a, a big benefit. Yeah, it's always, it always is easier to, to retro or not to, to actually design it into the system before you start, but it, it's not yeah. impossible to retroactively make those changes. You know, um, I think it, it does potentially cost more, but sometimes it, it doesn't. You know, and I think the reality with all of that is you've got to look at the project uh, in its in its entirety um, and on its own merit. So it's not a one size fits all kind of methodology. It's it's very specific to each product or each process. So right. in that, I think that's a that's a big con, you know. I mean, yeah. a big pro. Do you, see, <laughs> do you see Gavin's question right here? When you say certification, it sounds if it sounds as if it's more about transparent documentation. Is that correct, or is there a bar set to get over? It's both. Um, yes, there's there's lots of documentation to 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 bring into the mix. Um, so there's. The bar is basically looking at right. You can come in at an entry level at um, at bronze. Then you go to silver, gold, and platinum. There aren't many platinum pro products out there in the world yet, so you know that's the bar, if you wish. Um, and the transparency and documentation is is a difficult process because you know some products are complex, and you know there's like a phone has nine hundred and seventy three different components in it. Um, yeah. Each of those components have a supply chain. That supply chain is a complex supply chain. So, you know, for, for, a, for a project that, for example, um, we, we did a, I'm not going to mention the name of the phone, um, but it is a fruit. Um, they have, they looked at getting this done and it would have cost a lot of money, you know, like almost $22 million and would have probably taken about 12 years because of that supply chain, for example. Um, so, so the assessment done on that in terms of every single tiny little bit of chemistry and tiny little bit of electronics um, is immense. Um, but, you know, if you've got a thing like this, for example, it's cradle to cradle certified at bronze level. Um, it's made out of two different plastics and easy to make, you know, really, really easy. Um, the assessment on that would have taken probably 18 months and not cost a huge amount of money. You know? So it depends on the complexity of the, the, the product that you're looking at. Um, materials in terms of textiles and so forth are not massively complex. Um, if you're using cradle to cradle dyes, certified dyes, for example, um, you know, you're winning already. I like it. Okay. So I, I have to agree, Marco, that the challenge in this industry is education. People and or consumers don't understand the products or plant, not just on the hemp side, but also I think on the circularity or the cradle to cradle certification, right? It, they don't understand. Uh, I surely didn't. I did not realize the footprint around textiles or the lack of manufacturing in the United States for our textiles and the lack of ethical practices involved in textiles. <laughs> and so I know that that's along all of these. Yeah. yeah. I know, absolutely. I, you know, Marco, is it? Um, yeah. It's, you're completely right. You hit the nail on the head. I think the, the, you know, the reality with all of this stuff is education. You know, I'm learning every day and I've been around this stuff since, you know, 27, uh, 2007. Um, I think the, the, for me, personally, uh, you know, this is a very personal perspective. Every single day I learn something new about this thing that I'm involved in, you know. Um, and today I spent, you know, two hours this morning teaching uh, a room full of young kids 
um, well, a room full. There were four of them on a Zoom <laughs> um, about what the circular economy is and how that looks in their in their world. You know, um, so it was a really simple thing about just spending an hour talking to youngsters about what is what's the difference between recycling, what's the difference between reuse, what's the difference between composting, what's the difference between biodegrading. You know, this. It's literally just kind of like, hey, these are the things that we've learned, you know, um, and we're learning new things every day. And that's the innovation part. It's like when, when we learn how to take the things we've, we've, the new things we've learned and apply them into our daily lives, that becomes innovation. So, you know, my business partner, West business partner, Paul and myself, we, we realized very soon after creating the, the cradle to cradle marketplace that education was a critical element of that, you know. Um, so, you know, if you're, if you're prepared to, to always keep learning, uh, we're always prepared to keep teaching. So, you know, I think that's the, that's the, the trick and, you know, you guys, the hemp industry, I'm, I'm novice in this environment, but, uh, I have a passion for sustainability and those, when you meet those two environments, let's have a party, you know, let's get it going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it, well, and people say all the time, what is the biggest benefit of hemp? You know, and I, the, I would say what it's able to do for this circular economy, right? The on all aspects of sustainability and carbon sequestration and you know, regenerative soil or agriculture. And yes, there's these core pieces of the foundation that hemp sits right at the forefront of those conversations. And so it's pretty exciting. There's a couple of comments here that I absolutely agree what about what about programs where kids are encouraged to learn from creative applications with hemp products? I'm looking to get I'm looking at getting our football club kitted with hemp soccer kits, for example. Yes, this is exactly um, if we can encourage kids to now kids now in 10 years, we have entrepreneur, entrepreneurs. I 100 percent agree. And there's awesome. actually a couple there's a couple of um, individuals within our Global Hemp Association that are talking about doing programs like this, both for the FFA, the students after school programs. So reach out to me. Uh, my email is mandy at globalhempassociation.org, or you can, um, through the contact link on our website, send us a little message and I can help connect you through some of our other members. Then there was one other question or general, uh, let's see. How have companies created immediate inputs, typically ensured that they're, let's see. How have, hi, John, by the way, how have companies created intermediate inputs, typically ensured that their reputation is not partially degraded by selling to companies that are not C2C certified? We just move forward in imperfection, right? You can't be right all the time and it can't, you, you can't necessarily make uh, everything perfect from day one. So don't worry about that. I think, you know, if you don't have a cradle to cradle certified product uh, and you want to, um, there's a way to make that happen. Um, you know, the, 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 the real truth about that is, is the fact that, you know, the, the, we, we've got to try it. We've just got to try it. If it works, fantastic. If it doesn't, try something else. Um, I just put up the question again. I just want to, I just want to check it out. That's okay. Um, That's okay. Like to answer how, it how, how have how companies? Have Go ahead. Okay. So I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough one. Hey, good question. Uh, I'm going to have to think about that. Um, thanks, John. I think it's, it's a good one for me to, to go and ponder on. Do you mind me getting back to you on that? Um, I'll have to, yeah, I'll have to do a bit of research. <laughs> I'll send you an email intro. John's a great person to know and he's doing great things. Okay, fantastic. fantastic. There was another question Mark had. Would love to know more about particular hemp clothing, about how particular hemp clothing would be used for sportswear. Any suggestions or example, especially in the UK, would be helpful. Um, we have an entire textile group that I would love to introduce as well. And do you have anything you want to add, add to this comment? Yeah, I've got, um, there is a company here who's making hemp uh, clothing. Um, I'll definitely make introductions to Mark. Thank you, Mark, for the question. Um, I think it's it's almost kind of a no-brainer now because um, the more we dive into accessibility of the materials and the things, the more we find. Um, you know, I did a bit of research today uh, or earlier this afternoon to to find out, you know, what's happening in the UK with, with all of the stuff. And 
I was quite surprised to find there are three companies that are making clothing, you know. Um, yes, some of the materials are potentially being imported from other countries, etc. But the fact that it's being made and, and is happening is, is there, you know. It is the most breathable material, most non-toxic if you're not putting any bad inks on there or dyes. Um, so it is a real no-brainer in terms of clothing manufacture. Um, I know Tony Budden, one of the one of the top hemp, hemporium leaders in South Africa, um, you know, had his his um, his business is all about creating healthy hemp clothing. You know, um, so the hemp clothing is out there. We we can find it, and if we need some in the UK, I'm sure we'll find the right thing. Thanks, Mark. Yep, absolutely. Mark, we can help as well. This is another thing. This is kind of our goal or one of our goals with the association is to help drive those connections. So reach out to me. I can help there as well. Um, but thank you very much for that. Well, anything else that you want to add really quick to anybody that's listening or say before we close up to anyone that's listening? And then one last question is what should people be paying attention to? What should people maybe be talking about that's not being talked about enough um I, i'm gonna i'm gonna jump into this just kind of you know feet first um it's all about policy you know so i think we really need to push um both federal and state government um and country government to to basically like just lift the lid on this whole thing you know um, policy in terms of not only getting hemp to where it needs to be as a, as a material and treated the same as cotton or the same as, as well, not, not the same, but you know what I mean, like legislate in a way that is that, that allows it to become the burgeoning market it is, as well as the cradle-to-cradle -cradle methodology, you know. So like some of the, the work that, that um, Jeline and Paul, my, my ex-business partners, have done, they, you know, we put a lot of effort into making or getting the UK Environment Agency to, to look at the cradle-to-cradle -cradle materials. And now they've adopted that, those principles and those materials into their, their policy document. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a smallish agency. They're responsible for about 300 million um, in that particular part of the, the, the Thames, for example. But the fact that it's happening is there. And I think if we, if we keep doing that, if we keep lobbying, we keep pushing for policy to create this opportunity in the US or globally even, um, then we'll win. So just keep, keep the fight going basically, you know? Yeah, the conversation, right? It has to be normalized and it has to be at the forefront. Uh, it's funny in the U.S. When I, when we're on group calls and we have so many people on the international, you know, scale joining in, in on our calls, the conversation just seems so normal that we're talking about sustainability, circular economies all around and hemp, right? I get into the United States and it's those questions just, they're not at the forefront yet. The concern, and, and I shouldn't say at all they are on some but the majority of it's the penalties are not in, uh as severe i guess or uh, the implications are not really as well known as in the united states as they are across the rest of the globe and so yeah. you know, shout out to everybody is it's coming and now we have an opportunity to get ahead of the game and instead of waiting until it's too late and the fines or fees are you know 10 times the penalties um yeah the time really is now and reality is we don't have any time to wait we don't have any any longer to wait when it comes to what we're doing to our planet yeah. so right. again right. more what i did not know until i got into hemp until i started really surrounding myself with brilliant minds like yourself it's mind-boggling it is but you know as I, as, as I keep saying you know together we can so you know, let's team up with the right people, do the right things for the right reasons at the right time, and we'll get it right. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining. I really appreciate it, Gav Gavin. Thank you. Thank you, John, again. We appreciate it. Okay, well, you guys, I appreciate everything everybody, everything everybody's done today. Um, have a wonderful day. Join us back here at 2 o'clock, um, where we're going to be talking about similar conversations, but with three other guests. And so we'll see you then. And Brendan, I appreciate you. Anything that you need, don't hesitate to holler at me. And if anybody else has questions or would like help reaching Brendan or needs needs any um, help about 
I guess any of the subjects or conversation that we had today, don't hesitate to reach out and I will help put you two together. So thank you very much, sir. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.